Um, so now we are going to read. And as Ollie said, the reading is from John chapter 1. And I'll read from verse 1 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, John chapter 1, why don't I uh, just pray. We thank you indeed, Father God, that Jesus is Lord. Lord over creation, Lord over history, Lord of salvation, Lord of the word. Pray that you would reveal more to us of the glory of the Lord Jesus as we look at his word now together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Who am I is one of the most uh, essential questions that we could ask about ourselves or about another person. It is a question that goes right to the core of who a person is. It's about the genuine them. Who am I? It's a question that people who came into uh, contact with Jesus often asked. Uh, the disciples asked it after having watched Jesus calm a storm that was as ferocious as Storm Arwin. Uh, as he calmed it simply by telling the storm to be quiet, they looked at each other petrified in fear and said, Who is this man? Uh, the crowds who heard Jesus teaching, they were so amazed by what he was saying. They were saying, is he the prophet, uh, like the Old Testament prophets of old but greater? Or, or is he the Christ, God's promised eternal king? Herod is intrigued by him and wants to find out more. Uh, Pilate interrogates him and asks him, are you the king of the Jews? Everyone who meets Jesus wants to know who is this man. Who is he? In fact, it is the question that Jesus very deliberately and pointedly asks his closest followers. He says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And in fact, through them, through the record of that conversation, Jesus is actually asking every person the same question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? It's a question that divides friends, divides families, divides religions, divides the world and divides history. In fact, this question is the most important question that anyone can ever consider because your answer to who you think Jesus is uh, will not just determine your experience in this life, it will define your eternity. And don't let that statement wash over you. If you're here this morning uh, and you have little knowledge about who Jesus is, maybe you're, maybe you're here out of curiosity. Maybe you're here out of habit. Maybe you're here because your parents made you come here. What we are looking at when we look at the Bible, who 
we are looking at when we look at the Bible is the most important thing you will ever look at. The most important thing you will ever think about. The most important thing you will ever respond to in your life. Who you decide that Jesus is, is the most important, fundamental, eternally significant decision that you will ever make. And last December, we looked at part of the answer to this question. We saw that, who is Jesus? Jesus is a man. He is fully human. He's not partly human. He's not something that's dressed up to look like a human. He is a living, breathing, thinking, feeling human being. He, he is what the Bible calls the second Adam. He is the one who has come to be the, all that Adam failed to be and to do all that Adam failed to do. And so he obeys God fully when Adam failed to. He enjoys a perfect relationship with God that Adam lost. He reigns over creation in partnership with God in a way that Adam failed to do. And, and so he is the one that God pours out all of his blessings through, not just onto his people, but onto the whole of creation. And as a man, Jesus is able to be our substitute for sin. He can offer himself as a sacrifice to sin, but he can also sympathize with us as we struggle to live for God. And he is an example to us of how to live for God. How to be spirit-filled people as we seek to grow in faith, grow in wisdom, and grow in godliness. And you should step back at that point and go, wow, what a man. What a man. A real man. A genuine man. The best a man could ever be. Now, Jesus is fully human and he shows us what it means to be fully human, truly human. But you know, the other amazing claim of Scripture is that Jesus is also divine. He is fully man, but He is also fully God. You see, the Bible teaches that there is one God. There is no other there is one God who has revealed Himself in creation, in the universe, in the world around you. He has revealed Himself through history and He's, he's revealed Himself through the Bible. One God who exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Each of those persons is fully God, distinct from the other but never separate. One God in three persons and each person is fully God. And the amazing miracle that we celebrate at Christmas is that the baby who was born to Mary, Jesus the man, is also God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. The one who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, eternal, uncreated, existing outside of time and space, God the Son is in the flesh. You say, okay, the incarnation of Jesus, God being uh, fully man. It, it's amazing, it's incredible, but so what? Why does it matter? It, is it God just showing off? Hey, look, I can even do this. It, is it just God doing something that makes us go, yeah, he really is incredible? I mean, it is amazing. C.S. Lewis described this as the central miracle of the Bible. It does show how incredible God is. But it is more than that. Jesus being God is essential for our salvation. It's essential for our eternity. And it is essential for our ongoing life of faith. And so over these three Sundays before Christmas, we're going we're gonna to look uh, at one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, written by one of his closest friends, the Gospel of John, who not only shows us that Jesus really is God, but also why that is really important. 
because John makes that clear that, that that is why he has written this gospel. If you keep a finger in John chapter 1 but flick to the end of, his, of, of the gospel there, it, it, John chapter 20, it's on page 1090. So this is John saying why he's written this gospel. And John 20, verse 30, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That phrase there, the, the Son of God, when John uses that phrase, he, he's using it to say that Jesus is God the Son. John wants you to know that Jesus is God and so that by knowing that Jesus is God that you may have life in his name. And, and life for John is life to the full. It's the best life that starts now and then goes on into eternity. And John says that we only receive that life through Jesus, God the Son. So we have the witness of John that, uh, to the fact that Jesus really is fully God. But, but before we look at that in some more detail, first I want us to just briefly look at the witness of the whole Bible. I won't spend time going through the whole Bible but the witness of this in the Bible. Um, uh, and then we're going to look at the witnesses of those who met Jesus in some of the other Gospels, and then we'll focus right in on the witness of the Gospel of John. So first, the, the witness of the whole Bible. And you know, Jesus is there in the very first chapter of the Bible. In Genesis 1, we're told how God made the whole earth, how he made every living thing. And then lastly, it's kind of the pinnacle of his creation, is the peak of, of, of what he's doing, God makes humans. And we're told that he does that by saying, let us make mankind in our image. Now there is an us there. He doesn't just say, let me make man in my image, as if he's talking to himself in the mirror. He says, let us make mankind in our image. There is, there's more than one person there. There's one God but there's more than one person. And you say, okay, but how do we know that is Jesus? Well, there it is in John 1. John says that the person he witnessed walking, talking, teaching, healing, dying, rising again, is John chapter 1 verse 1, the Word. He, he's in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And, and John here is deliberately pointing us back to Genesis 1. So Genesis 1, the first few words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through Him all things were made, without Him nothing was made that has been made. Do you see that the Word, Jesus, was with God and was God in the beginning? Let us make mankind in our image. Through Him all things were made. Jesus is there in the beginning as the Creator. But he's also there in the beginning as the promised king and saviour. A few chapters in Genesis 3, we're told about the fall where, where Adam and Eve disobey God and sin enters the world and, and the perfect world and the perfect relationship between God and humanity is absolutely wrecked. And so God announces his judgment on humanity and on the world, but he also makes a promise. Genesis 3.15, God promises that a child of Eve will one day come and crush Satan and reverse all that was lost and damaged and destroyed in the fall. 
Now, it says that this will be a human. It will be an offspring of Eve, a second Adam. That's what we thought about last year. But as this promise is developed through the Bible, we see that this seed of Eve, this man who would be a king, God's promised and anointed king, will also in some way be God himself. Just uh, uh, um, Akumu at the start of her prayer quoted from Isaiah uh, chapter, chapter 9 and it's a famous passage. We, we, we read it out uh, almost every Christmas. We're going to do it at the carol service. Um, and, 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 and Isaiah says, uh, it, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Do you, do you see that amazing statement? A, a child is going to be born, but he's going to be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, that. They're all God descriptions, aren't they? Which is why it is so amazing that, that when the angel comes uh, to this young virgin called Mary, he says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are co uh, to call him Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now that's an interesting description there, isn't it? The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. It's an echo back to Genesis 1 again where, where you've got uh, God creating the world and His Spirit is hovering over the waters of the deep. Uh, and it's also an echo back to the tabernacle where the presence of God would overshadow the tent of meeting. It, it, what you've got here is the presence of God in His creating power coming upon Mary and conceiving the baby in her womb so that no human father is involved and so it is called the Son of God. It is this central miracle of the Bible, God joining two natures, God and man, in the one person, in this baby. And he says, He will be given the throne of David and reign over God's kingdom and God's people eternally forever that's the promise of Isaiah the, the wonderful counsellor the mighty God the everlasting father the prince of peace and he will reign on David's throne and of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end Amen I love it when we can do this in the Bible I love this this tracing of a, of a promise that starts here and you just see it being magnified and developed and, 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 and gets greater and greater until you get to Jesus who is the fulfilment of this glorious promise. Learn these promises. Learn these passages. Get them into your heart so that your heart leaps with joy and sings with a confidence as you look at the glory of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then, when you're talking to your friends and they don't seem that fussed about Jesus and they're like, Christmas, yeah, the baby in the manger, you need to go to them. Do you know who this is? You, 
You think it's just a nice little thing that we remember at Christmas? That's God! Let me show you who this baby is. And you take them to Genesis 1. And you take them to Isaiah 9. And you take them to Luke chapter 1. And you take them to John chapter 1. But you know the Bible doesn't just talk about Jesus being God before he was born. It, it talks about him after his resurrection as well. So, so you've got the... The, the, the people who, who witness Jesus after his resurrection. And, and you see the disciples, they come face to face with the risen Jesus. Uh, and, and then when he ascends to heaven, what is their reaction? They fall down and worship him. These, these are Jews, okay? The, these are people who were brought up repeating every day, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And they had drummed into them the commandment um, that they were not to have any other gods except God and not to bow down to any other thing or person except God. And you say, but hang on. I know my Bible. There are a few times where Jewish people come face to face with angels and they fall down and they start to worship them. But what happens when they do that? The angels go, stop, what are you doing? Don't worship me. But when people do this to Jesus, he doesn't tell them to stop. The amazing thing is he accepts their worship as God accepts the worship of his people. Jesus allows them to worship him as God. You know, one of the arguments people try and use to say that Jesus uh, is not God is that they say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, we'll see about that in a minute. But, but you know, he certainly accepted the worship uh, of people as if he was God. And we have an amazing example of it in the Gospel of John himself. Thomas, one of the disciples. He's not there when Jesus first appears to the whole group after his resurrection and he says, no, no, unless I see it for myself, unless I can put my fingers in the scars in his hand and, and touch the scar in his side, I won't believe. And then a week later, as Thomas stands face to face with the resurrected Jesus and he says, come on then, put, put your hand in here. Put your hand in here. What does Thomas do? He looks at Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, no, don't get carried away, Thomas. I'm, you know, he just, he accepts that declaration. Now we'll see later that that kind of talk Declaring someone is God, that, that kind of talk gets you stoned to death. It's blasphemy. Unless the person you're talking to really is God. But then you've got the witness of those who wrote and taught about Jesus after his resurrection. People like Paul. Philippians 2 verse 6, Paul says uh, that Jesus, who being in very nature God, or another way of translating is that is being in the form of God. Now, when we talk about form, we're often talking about outward appearance. We're talking about the shape of something, the outline of something. But when Paul uses that word, he means the exact opposite. He, he, he means form as in the inner substance or the nature of something. He means that thing that it's made up of. And he's saying that Jesus doesn't just appear to be like God. He's not just looking like God. In his being, in his essence, Jesus is God. And he goes on to say, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So Paul is saying Jesus is equal to God. Well, God is God. There is only one God. Nothing is like God, let alone equal to him. That's what God says himself. Isaiah 46 verse 9, he says, I am God, there is no other. I am God there is none like me. No one is like God. Nothing and no one is like God. Nothing and no one is equal to God. And so for Jesus to be equal with God must mean that Jesus is God. You're still with me. That's good. But it's not just Paul that says it. The writer of the Hebrews says it. And then John chapter 1, he says it. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. 
and the Word was God. Do you see, the Word, Jesus, is with God and was God and was with God in the beginning. Do you see why Lafraz goes on at us an awful lot about getting your friends to look at John chapter 1? He's going to do it again next weekend as well, just to warn you. But you know the reason he does it? It's because you are faced in John chapter 1 straight away in clear and bold and glorious statements with the answer to the most important question, who is Jesus? He is the Word who was with God and who was God and was with God in the beginning. He is Jesus, the one who, is, who all things were made through. In fact, in those first 13 verses of John you've got a summary of everything we've been talking about this morning it's about the incarnation of Jesus that that Jesus is the word distinct from the father yet fully God that he exists before time and creation that he is the agent of creation the source of life verse 4 in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind and that God the son who is God existing before time and creation, he, who is the source of life. Verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us, so that, verse 18, He could com- uniquely reveal the Father. And so that is the wider witness of Scripture. That is the witness of Scripture that Jesus really is God. But then you have, you have the witness of those that met Jesus recording in the Gospels. Now here's a trick question for you. Who is the first recorded person to meet the baby Jesus in the Bible? Okay, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a plea for the wise men. Any, anybody else? Sorry? Met, someone says Mary. Shepherds. John the Baptist you're all it's Elizabeth it's Elizabeth you can debate this with me later if you want I'm sure someone will but I think it's Elizabeth you see in this in the gospel of Luke there is this beautiful account that that Mary is told that she is pregnant she goes off to meet Elizabeth and Elizabeth just hears the voice of the pregnant Mary and the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy and Elizabeth says why am I so favoured that the mother of my Lord should come to me now she is not just being very respectful at that point and there is something miraculous going on here. Elizabeth's baby is leaping at the very presence of Jesus. And Elizabeth is declaring that baby to be her Lord. That is a title that people reserved for God alone. And then yes, there are the Magi. And there are the shepherds. And they're bowing down and they're worshipping him. And we've already said that bowing down and worshipping is something that was reserved for God alone. People see this baby and their reaction is spontaneous worship. It's like a natural but incredibly strong reaction to being in the presence of Jesus. And the angels, they, an- they worship him as they announce his birth. They sing glory to God, but they're not the only spiritual beings in the gospel. Demons might not worship Jesus, but they're absolutely terrified of him. And, and when, whenever, we're told in Mark chapter 3, whenever the impure spirits see him, they fall down before him and cry out. What do they cry out? You are the Son of God. And, and what do people witness when they see Jesus? They, they see him claim to have the authority to forgive sins, which, as his opponents are very quick to point out, only God has the authority to do that. They see him calm storms and walk on water, which is something that Job in his book and, and in the Psalms claim are the actions of God himself. They see him peer into the mind of people and perceive their thoughts before they said a word. Only God has that power. And they see him raise the dead. Luke chapter 7, he walks up to a funeral procession and he tells the dead young man to get up and he gets up. 
And he does the same for Jairus' daughter. And he does the same at his, the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And you say, okay, but I know some Old Testament prophets made people rise from the dead. And they did, but what did they have to do? They had to call on God, didn't they? They had to, you know, they have to lie on the person and they have to, they have to pray fervently. But what does Jesus do? Lazarus, come out. And he comes out. Do you know, someone once said to me that it's a good job that Jesus was specific and said Lazarus, otherwise everybody in the cemetery might have come out that morning. Now, now turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And verse 21. And Jesus says, John chapter 5, verse 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, the Father, God, can give life and take life and give life back again. Even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. And we're back in John. And I want us to stay here for a moment. Because we've had the witness of the whole Bible. We've had the witness of, of those that saw Jesus recorded in the Gospels. And now let's look at the witness of John himself. And we've seen, haven't we, a lot of witness already. We, we've, we've seen John's incredible statement in chapter 1 as he opens up his Gospel. We've seen his appeal in John chapter 20 as he closes the Gospel that, that you may see from his witness that Jesus is the Son of God and by, and by seeing that that you'd have life in his name. And we've had the eyewitness of his, of his, of his friend Thomas. But we also see it as John records the accusations of Jesus' opponents. I said earlier, to claim to be God or even to use the name of God was considered a blasphemy that was so offensive it was punished by stoning. And so in, in John chapter 8, Jesus is disputing with his, with his opponents and the argument is revolving around Abraham, who, who's the father of the Jewish people. And at the end of the argument, Jesus makes this incredible statement. He says that before Abraham was, I am. Now that is not just Jesus saying, yeah, I was around two and a half thousand years ago. No, Jesus is using the phrase, I am. That is the personal name for God that God himself gave to Moses in the burning bush when he says, who should I say sends me? He says, tell them I am has sent you. So for those, for those who try to argue that Jesus never claimed to be God, they need to go back and read John 8. Because Jesus' opponents know that is exactly what Jesus is claiming by their reaction. John 8, 59, at this, they picked up stones to stone him. And we see the same thing in John chapter 10, which we're going to look at in a few weeks' time. But let's stay here in John chapter 5, because we looked at what Jesus claims in verse 21. But look, and, look at what happened just before that in verse 18. For this reason... They tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Remember, no one is equal with God. Only God is equal with God. And maybe you're sat here going, oh, I'm struggling to keep up. We've been all over the Bible. I'm not quite sure where we are. And if that's you, I am really pleased. Because it's showing you that this is not just some odd, uh, ob, some odd, obscure passage. Here and there, just a little bit of a hint that, well, maybe Jesus could be, you, you might make a, a reasonable argument to say he's God. No, the whole Bible is wonderfully telling you that Jesus really is God. And so you can have absolute confidence that Jesus really is God. And so don't be overwhelmed by all of this stuff this morning. Stand back and be amazed. Stand back and rejoice in the miracle. The miracle that the baby in the manger that we celebrate this month is also the God of the universe. 
that the one who, who John testifies is the bread of life. The, the one who John says is the living water that means people who drink from him will never grow thirsty he is also the one who is somehow dependent on the milk of his mother and the spoon feeding of his father. That the one who is the word who spoke creation into being babbles and coos and needs to learn to speak and read and write. It's like the children's song we sang a few times in Mark's Gospel. It's, it's Jesus. His word upholds the galaxies, yet he babbled like a baby in his mother's arms. Jesus, who understands the universe, but he had to go to school to learn how to write his name. Jesus, who, worked upon, who walked upon the ocean blue, but his feet got tired and dirty too on the dusty road. Jesus cried when his friend Lazarus died, but his power wrote, brought him back to life when he called his name. Marvel at that miracle. Be amazed. Bow down. Worship. Sing praises. Rejoice as Elizabeth rejoiced and as the shepherds rejoiced and as the Magi rejoiced and as the angels rejoiced. He's totally God and totally man. Both in one. He's the great I am. To save the world and fulfill God's plan, He had to be totally God and totally man. And that's the point. It's why it's so important that we understand and know that Jesus is God. Because it's only if Jesus is God that He can save us. Yes, He needs to be fully, genuinely a man to save us, but He also needs to be fully, totally God. Which is why I wanted you to stay there in John chapter 5, because... Jesus claims to be God. And as God, verse 21, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. And so, verse 24, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears My word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Has crossed over from death to life. Now we're going to think about what that means next week. But just rejoice for now in the fact that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you listen to His Word, then you have crossed from death to life. John 20, 31. These things are written that you may believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Let's pray. Father God, we just need to spend a minute stepping back, absorbing all that we've heard this morning, all that we've seen in your word. Absorb all that the Lord Jesus is, who he is. The man, Christ Jesus. The one who is fully man but fully God two natures complete coming together in the one person that, that the God who never slumbers or sleeps is asleep in a boat 
the God who is spirit, walks on this earth as a man. Lord, we, <laughs> we cannot grasp how that happens. But your word is clear, absolutely clear, that it is true and that it is necessary. So we pray that you would help us this morning as we, as we try and grasp on to some of the, the magnificent glory that is the Lord Jesus. You would cause our hearts to sing and our souls to rise and we would have an absolute confidence in the glory and the power and the love and the salvation and the eternal life that is offered to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. We ask and pray in his name and for his eternal glory. Amen.